Good morning. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you back to the second day of the symposium. If you weren't here yesterday, my name is Jeff McCurry. I'm the director of the Simon Silverman Phenomenology Center. This is our 32nd annual symposium on phenomenology in the African and Africana worlds. Um, we had a good day yesterday. Um, I think we'll have another good day today. As I've been saying, I think uh, we'll have an intimate crowd today. Uh, the, the roads are uh, not good, as I think several of us realized already today. Um, but uh, we, will, we will proceed. And um, uh, maybe a small audience, but I think it's a good audience from seeing who's out there. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Roger Brooke of the Psychology Department, who will be this morning's moderator. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to uh, introduce and privilege to introduce Professor C Catherine um, Gines to you. Uh, professor Gines, she's Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Penn State University. She earned her PhD in philosophy from the University of Memphis in 2003 and has taught uh, with postdoc fellowships at uh, Vanderbilt University and Emory University, where Gaines uh, served as a fellow in the Center for Humanistic Inquiry. Her primary interests include continental philosophy, existentialism, Africana philosophy, black feminist philosophy, and the critical philosophy of race. In addition to co-editing the anthology Convergences, Black Feminism and Continental Philosophy, she is the author of Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. Gaines is founding co-editor of the scholarly journal Critical Philosophy of Race, the founding director of the Collegium of Black Women Philosophers, director of the Cultivating Underrepresented Students in Philosophy, and the founding director of the Center for Balanced Living. Additionally, Gaines serves as a certified coach for the National Center for Faculty Diversity and Development. It's lovely to have you here. Welcome, and thank you for coming. So thank you all for coming out on a snowy Saturday morning. You are like the committed scholars and thinkers um, of Pittsburgh this morning. So the title of my paper is Black Looks, Objectification, Subjectivity, and Looking Back. Um, and before I jump into the paper, I do want to start out with just a little bit of uh, thanks and gratitude. So I would like to begin by thanking uh, Jeffrey for inviting me to be a part of this amazing symposium. And I would also like to express my gratitude to the other symposium speakers for the rich papers that have been shared. So um, although weather prevented me from hearing the papers, I did get an opportunity to read the papers, and they were um, very, very rich papers. Um, also, I want to take a moment to thank, in his absence, my partner of 14 years, Jason, who is lovingly caring for our children in my absence back in State College right now. So I make it a point to publicly thank him. I think um, husbands in the audience should publicly thank their wives in the same way. Um, so situating myself, I am at Penn State University in the philosophy department. The job description for which I was hired is critical philosophy of race with special interests in African diaspora and or African American philosophy. But as was mentioned in the introduction, I also work on continental or U European philosophy. Rather than segregating these areas of philosophical inquiry, or worse, assuming that they are mutually exclusive or incompatible, I integrate them in an effort to demonstrate how they inform and reinforce one another. I'm interested in the relevance of philosophy to analyses of race and gender, freedom and oppression, theories of liberation, and the significance of political agency for black descendants of Africa around the world. I am also very curious about how the discipline of philosophy, despite its racist, sexist, anti-feminist, heterosexist overtones and undertones that are still prevalent in a profession, or more specifically how existentialist phenomenology provides a useful theoretical framework for examining the relationship between the African diaspora and Europe, particularly as it pertains to notions of history, culture, location, and adopted identity, 
as well as gender and sexuality. So the first portion of my talk poses the broad foundational question of who and or what qualifies as a philosopher or as philosophy. This section provides a wide view of perceptions about what is legitimately philosophical, against which we can consider a more focused view of intellectual contacts and exchanges between Jean-Paul Sartre, representing Europe, and some of his interlocutors representing Africa or the diaspora. In the second portion of the paper, I examine the gaze as a philosophical framework for theorizing race and the lived experience of being raced. Towards that end, I examine the gaze as presented by Sartre in several of his works, alongside Africana notions of the gaze in the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois, Richard Wright, Franz Fanon, and Bell Hooks. I contend that we gain a richer understanding of Sartre's philosophy and analysis of race, and we are also better able to critique it when we take seriously the works of figures like Du Bois, Wright, and Fanon, as well as Hooks, whose analyses are bolstered by their lived experience of blackness. White philosophers can learn both what to do and what not to do from Sartre's example. Plainly stated, Sartre, as a white man, has limitations with regard to his standpoint. By listening to his black interlocutors, Sartre is able to gain more insight about his own being a white man in the world. In other words, Sartre's interlocutors are not native tour guides guiding him on an exotic adventure into the hearts and minds of black people so that he can speak with authority about the so-called Negro problem. Rather, it is in dialogue with the other that Sartre sees himself. That is, he discovers the myths and shortcomings of his own whiteness. So now I'm getting into the introduction, thinking phenomenology in the African and Africana worlds. Who and or what qualifies as a philosopher or as philosophy? The history of philosophy has been constructed as decidedly European, and that is true not only for the so-called continental tradition, but also for analytic philosophy and even American philosophy and pragmatism. A typical introductory philosophy textbook presents the history of philosophy as originating in ancient Greece with Thales and continuing through the Middle Ages, modern period, and contemporary period with a list of almost exclusively white, male, European, and a few American philosophers. In some cases, the textbook may also cite Vedic and Upanishad philosophers of India, a section on quote unquote Eastern traditions that might include Chinese philosophy, Confucius or Buddhism, a section on Muslim philosophers, and or a very short mention of African thought. And it's always African thought, almost never African philosophy. I acknowledge that there are exceptions to this trend. For example, I'm using a text for an undergraduate course this semester that includes both so-called Western and non-Western philosophers. It's a text that was a challenge to, to locate. But the overwhelming majority of introductory philosophy readers are constructed in this exclusive format and unfortunately, there are philosophy professors who wouldn't have it any other way. The familiar tracing of philosophical origins from Greece and then dispersed throughout Europe, namely Germany, France, and England, but not so much countries like Spain and Turkey, and then to the United States, is one that some philosophers, professors, and students find comforting. But others find this quite alienating. The suspiciously European historical origins of the discipline of philosophy as typically presented in the history of philosophy courses, have been called into question in books like Theophile Obinga's Ancient Egypt and Black Africa, and George G.M. James's Stolen Legacy, Greek Philosophy is Stolen from Egyptian Philosophy. While Obinga's and James's books may not have been taken very seriously, Martin Bernal's Black Athena, The Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, certainly received critical attention. Those critics include Mary Lefkowitz, author of Not Out of Africa, How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth as History, and History Lesson, A Race Odyssey, along with Black Athena Revisited. This uproar concerning intellectual contacts or exchanges between Europe and Africa is noteworthy because it points to deep-seated conceptions of or attitudes about these places and spaces and the inhabitants therein. To attribute an intellectual influence from Egypt or Africa to Greece or Europe is seen by some as backward. The widely circulated and accepted opinion that Europe is a place inhabited by rational thinking political beings while the inhabitants of Africa or Haiti 
or New Orleans are portrayed as emotional, irrational, incapable of reason, animalistic, and savage is one that persists unfettered. There is an ontological and dialectical construction of Europe and Africa, the African diaspora, that should be examined more closely. The issue that I am pointing to here is not specific, the specific question of whether Greek philosophy is stolen from Egypt per se. Rather, I'm moving us toward the more general question of philosophical contacts and exchanges as it relates to who and or what qualifies as a philosopher or as philosophy. This is a question that usually motivates, but at times discourages me. As Henry Oruka states, there is an implicit belief that philosophy is an activity of some races and civilizations, but not as other, of others. Philosophy is Greek or European. It is white. Strictly speaking, it is white male. Or as Kwame Anthony Appiah notes, philosophy is regarded as the highest status label of Western humanism. The claim to philosophy is the claim to what is most important, most difficult, most fundamental in the Western tradition. When this question discourages me, I ask, why do I insist on inserting myself or other intellectuals who are women and or people of color into this space that has been constructed as explicitly white and male? When the question motivates me, I set my sights on decolonizing the philosophy canon and creating a space for myself and other others within a discipline that is capable of being both hospitable and hostile. I ask who gave white men ownership of philosophical discourse? Why shouldn't I or wouldn't I because of or in spite of my embodied existence, that is my embodiment as a black woman, be interested in philosophical reasoning and fields of inquiry? Today I am feeling very motivated about the prospects of decolonizing the philosophy canon and I am encouraged to have, the to have the opportunity to present this paper in a space that feels very hospitable. With that said, the remaining portion of my essay will be on Sartre and his interlocutors. While it is often assumed that Sartre influenced his black counterparts, particularly Fanon and Wright, I contend that this influence was not one-sided. These black intellectuals also informed Sartre's understanding of the world and his own being in the world. Sartre was able to speak out against oppression precisely because he was in dialogue with those who experienced oppression. I begin with background information about the contacts and exchanges between Sartre, Beauvoir, Wright, and Fanon. Next, I have been critical of some of Sartre's positions, so I will briefly outline some of those critiques. And finally, I will examine more closely the theoretical impact of these intellectuals on Sartre's philosophy. In particular, I elucidate how Sartre takes up the idea of the white problem and his shifting analysis of the gaze. So background and context. In 1945, Jean-Paul Sartre made his first visit to the United States of America, where he witnessed the degradation and dehumanization of Jim Crow and racism against black Americans. The first issue of Le Temps Modern, the journal founded and edited by Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, along with Maurice Merleau-Ponty and others, was published in October of that same year. We know that Sartre was already familiar with Richard, Wright, Richard Wright's work at that time because the first issue included a French translation of Wright's story, Fire and Cloud, the final novella, and Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, Four Novellas. The editors of Le Temps Modern would continue to feature Wright's writings over several years. For example, in the 1946 special if issue of the United States, and included Wright's autobiographical, The Early Days in Chicago, later published in Eight Black Men under the title, The Man Who Went to Chicago. Also in 1947, Le Temps Modern's first six issues included translations of Wright's autobiography, Black Boy, Beauvoir's Ethics of Ambiguity, and Sartre's What is Literature. The following year, the journal would also feature the literature of the Negro in the United States and the provocative essay by Wright, I Tried to Be a Communist. Sartre had the opportunity to meet Wright in person for the first time during Wright's initial visit to France. This meeting took place in, 19, in March of 1946 at the home of Dorothy Norman, where Norman also introduced Wright to Hannah Arendt, Paul Tillich, and Albert Camus that same year. 
After this visit, Wright and his family returned to New York in February of 1947, which enabled Beauvoir to spend considerable time with Richard and Ellen Wright during her first trip to the United States, also in 1947. Beauvoir, like Wright, witnessed and was disturbed by, I'm sorry, like uh, Sartre, was wit witnessed and was disturbed by the segregation and racism in America throughout the South and the North. She recorded her experiences in her book, America Day by Day, which Beauvoir dedicated to Ellen and Richard Wright. Exasperated by the American brand of racism in the United States, Wright and his family relocated to France in August of 1947. Although Wright continued to travel to other countries, he would become a French citizen and live in France until his death in 1960. While in France, Wright continued to write, lecture, and participate in major conferences. For example, in December of 1948, a gathering titled The Internationalism of the Mind held at the Sorbonne included Wright, Sartre, and Camus as speakers. Wright was introduced and his speeches translated into French by Beauvoir. Two years later, in 1950, Wright founded the Franco-American Fellowship and Sartre gave a guest lecture in December of that year with Beauvoir translating. Then there was the historic 1956 First International Congress of Negro Writers and Artists, which was organized in part by Wright who invited Frantz Fanon as one of the speakers. He gave other lectures throughout Europe between 1950 and 1956. Four of them have been published together in the text White Man Listen. Like Wright, Frantz Fanon was also a major influence on European intellectual history, mainly discussions of psychology and philosophy with regard to race, humanism, colonialism, nationalism, and violence. And while it is commonly known that Sartre and Fanon had a debate about black Orpheus and that Sartre wrote the preface to Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, there has not been a lot of emphasis on the relationship between Wright and, and Fanon. Aside from the influence of Wright's work that can be seen in black skin, white masks, biographer David Macy notes that Fanon wrote a letter to Wright in which Fanon said he was working on a new study of the, new, of the human breadth of Wright's novels. He owned, he explained, copies of most of Wright's books and added, I'd greatly appreciate your letting me know the titles of those works I might be ignorant of. Although there is no evidence that Wright re ever received or replied to this letter, Turner, Lou Turner notes that Wright was the principal organizer of the 1956 Congress of Negro Writers and Artists and invited Fanon to speak at that Congress. It was the last time Fanon would speak publicly in France. With this background about Sartre and his interlocutors in mind, let me turn to my critique of Sartre before moving to my more positive assessment of his philosophical uh, contributions. And so this critique of Sartre is large, largely a, a racial critique. So in the essay, The Debate Between Sartre and Fanon 50 Years Later, I challenge Sartre's claim in Black Orpheus that we should reject the concept of race once an authentic race consciousness is attained through negritude. Sartre celebrates negritude, but then shifts his analysis from obtaining race consciousness to rejecting race in an effort to attain a raceless and classless society. The idea that black people ought to reject race to join the class struggle while with white workers was also expressed by Sartre in 1945, three years before Black Orpheus, when he wrote, there is only one solution to the black problem. When the American proletariat, black and white, will have recognized the identity of their interests in regards to the class of bosses. The Negroes will struggle with the white workers and inequality with them for the recognition of their rights. At this point, we might consider the significance of the title Black Orpheus. Orpheus is a character in Greek mythology known for the enchanting power of his music, singing, and poetry. According to one myth, Orpheus falls in love with Eurydice and marries her only to, you, to lose her prematurely when she dies of a snake bite. Orpheus goes down to the underworld to retrieve her and using his musical powers and prowess convinces Hades to release Eurydice. Hades agrees on the condition that Orpheus is not allowed to look back at Eurydice until they have fully ascended from the underworld. So you already see the gaze operating here. Of course, during their ascent, Orpheus impulsively looks back and loses Eurydice forever. Now for black Orpheus, or the so-called Negro, Eurydice represents race consciousness. The Negro falls in love with a positive conception of race, only to lose it prematurely. He uses negritude to regain a positive conception of race, only to look back and discover it is once again out of grasp. 
In spite of the musical or poetic prowess, race must be permanently abandoned in the underworld, allowing him to ascend from the cave and join the socialist cause. I am critical of Sartre for espousing this position, basically because I think it is inappropriate for him as a white man to suggest that black people reje reject race to, pri to prioritize class. I also find it counterproductive to reduce racial oppression to class oppression. This is not an uncommon problem for white liberals. And ironically, Sartre criticizes this liberal position in the fourth section of Anti-Semite and Jew. However, I do recognize that the prioritization of class, of, of class oppression is not unique to Sartre or white liberals. We see here the problem of ignoring the intersectionality of oppression. In this case, forgetting the fact that the black laborer is oppressed both as a laborer and as a Negro, or perhaps as a laborer because he is a Negro. This analysis also ignores the experience of women as laborers altogether. Consequently, I critique Sartre here for collapsing racial oppression into class oppression or prioritizing the latter over the former. The shortcoming in his analysis of race consciousness and black Orpheus trivializes the ongoing, not transitional project of collective positively constructed racial identities. While I will not go into the details of the debate between Sartre and Fanon concerning negritude and Sartre's black Orpheus and Fanon's the lived experience of the black, I will say that this is one case where Fanon does critique Sartre. And a lot of this, um, of course, has um, implications for today's rhetoric about being in a post-racial society, for example. And I don't get into that, but I've addressed um, the problematics of notions of post-racial society elsewhere. So let me briefly look at the kind of theoretical impact of Sartre and his interlocutors before getting to the gaze. So in what is literature? Jean-Paul Sartre writes, the books of Richard Wright will remain alive as long as the Negro question in the United, um, is, is raised in the United States. This claim might be interpreted in multiple ways. Sartre could be saying that reading Wright's work is crucial to understanding or engaging the Negro question in the United States. At the same time, Sartre might be interpreted as interpreted as suggesting, perhaps unintentionally, but nonetheless problematically, that Wright's work is only re relevant to the Negro question in the United States. For Sartre, the American Negro writer is the man who sees the whites from the outside, who assimilates white culture from the outside, I'm, I'm sorry, who, who assimilates white culture from the outside, and each of whose books will show the alienation of the black race within American society. Such a claim can be problematic because it takes for granted that the Negro question ought to be the focal point of black writers, limiting the range of our writing. Rather than assume that Sartre is placing limitations on the scope of black scholarship, I want to make this case that Sartre, knowingly or unknowingly, is actually pointing out the limitations of white scholarship, including his own. Sartre is acknowledging that Wright in particular, and black committed writers more generally, have access to something and contribute something that Sartre in particular and white intellectuals more generally do not or cannot. In this final section, I consider how Wright and Fanon, as well as Negritude poet Cesar Sangor, well, actually, I'm not, I won't get into that here. I get into the issue of colonialism and violence, but I've come cut that out. So, but this influence of Wright and Fanon and others can be seen in Sartre's understanding of racism, of colonialism and anti Semitism. Um, that problems of racism, colonialism, and anti-Semitism are white problems. Um, and you can also see the influence in his evolving notion of the gaze across several of Sartre's writings. So this issue of the white problem. When asked by a French reporter about the Negro problem in the 1940s, Richard Wright responded, there isn't any Negro problem. There is only a white problem. Gunnar Myrtle also takes this position in An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy in 1944. Myrtle states, we have been brought to the view, to view the caste order as fundamentally a system of disabilities forced by white whites upon the Negroes. And our discussion of the Negro problem up to this point has therefore been mainly a study of whites' attitudes and behaviors. The Negro problem is primarily a white man's problem. Sartre frequently references this two-volume study in Revolutionary Violence from Notebooks, Foreign Ethics, where he offers an analysis of oppression, racism, and slavery in the United States. While Margaret Simmons thinks that Wright probably introduced Beauvoir to Myrtle's work, biographer Deidre Baer 
points that points out that Beauvoir received a copy of the text from Nelson Algren in 1947. It is likely that Sartre had access to this text along with What the Negro Wants, edited by Rayford Logan, which Sartre also references through Beauvoir. In the conclusion of Anti-Semite and Jew, Sartre correctly attributes this claim that America does not have a Negro problem, but rather a white problem to white to right. Sartre takes the same position with regard to anti-Semitism. Namely, it is not a Jewish problem, it is our problem. Sartre asserts that the Jew is alienated from a hostile society created by white Europeans. He asserts, it is our eyes that reflect the Jew, that reflect to the Jew the unacceptable image <clears throat> that he wishes to dissimulate, dissimulate. It is our words, our gestures, all our words and all our gestures, our anti-Semitism, but equally our condescending liberalism that have poisoned him. It is we who constrain him to choose to be a Jew, whether through flight from her, himself or through self-assertion. It is we who force him into the dilemma of Jewish authenticity or inauthenticity. We have created this variety of men who have no meaning except as artificial products of a capitalist or feudal society. This species that bears witness for essential humanity better than any other because it was born of secondary reactions within the body of humanity. This quintessence of man, disgraced, uprooted, destined from the start to either inauthenticity or martyrdom. In this situation, there is not one of us who is not totally guilty and even criminal. The Jewish blood that the Nazis shed falls on our heads. And of course, there are a lot of um, critiques and problematics about Sartre's um, analysis of, of um, anti-Semitism and anti-Semite and Jew, but I think we can still point to um, that text as an, an important um, analysis of uh, subject formation and, and object formation for that matter um, with regard to race. So we can discuss that more in Q&A if people are interested. So Sartre's description of European eyes here <clears throat> points to his usage of the gaze in his analysis. In addition to understanding from right that there is a white problem, the impact of Sartre's interlocutors is also, a rec a recogniz is also recognizable and the expansion of Sartre's analysis of the gaze. So now I'm getting into the heart of the matter or the eyes of the matter, the gaze. So at the heart of the concept of the gaze and being in nothingness is the relationship that the self has with others. The self's encounter with others becomes terrifying, even antagonistic. This is the case because while I can see the other and attempt to reduce the other to an object, I must also recognize the subjectivity of the other when the other looks at me. It is in the other's gaze that I see myself as objectified by the other self and I am made a part of the other's world and freedom. Sartre presents a scenario in which he peeks through a keyhole and can see people behind the door without being seen by them. In this example, the peeper represents the subject. Those seen behind the door are reduced to objects. That is until the peeper hears footsteps and is suddenly confronted with the possibility that someone he can't see is looking at him, reducing him to an object. In this analysis, the subject doing the peeping or the gazing always poses the threat of non-recognition. In other words, he sees without being seen, thereby reducing me to an object. One might argue that this threat of objectification and non-recognition may be reciprocal between social, political, or other equals, but the issue becomes more complex in a society such as ours of race, class, and gender hierarchy. And although Sartre is obviously aware of race, class, and gender hierarchy, even in the, in the examples he gives of being for others in that text, his analysis of the gaze in light of such hierarchies becomes more developed later. So in being in nothingness, Sartre descri describes race and physical appearance as objective characteristics which define me and my being for others. In the case of the Jew, and let me note again that his analysis of the Jewish situation has been rightly criticized, Sartre asserts, it is only in my recognizing the freedom of anti-Semites and my assuming that this being a Jew, that I am a Jew for them. If on the contrary, it pleases me to consider the anti-Semites as pure objects, then my being a Jew disappears immediately to give place to the simple consciousness of being a free, unqualifiable transcendence. In Sartre's gaze return, the transformation of the phenomenology of racism, Robert Bernasconi explains that in being in nothingness, 
Sartre did not look beyond the situation in which the Jew transcended anti-Semitism by becoming the one who sees. Sartre does recognize that although we may not assume our being for others in infinite ways, we are not able to not assume it. He describes this condemnation to freedom or to choice as facticity. Some argue that Sartre's analysis of the gaze changes, and I would add, is enhanced between being in nothingness and the later work anti-Semite and Jew. For example, in Retrieving Experience, Sonia Crooks explains that while Sartre argues in being in nothingness, that the other is always a threat to my own experience of myself and that objectification is reciprocal. We come to, to discover an anti-Semite and Jew that this reciprocal objectification is not possible for the Jew in an anti-Semitic world. In Anti-Semite and Jew, Sartre explains how the anti-Semite and his gaze creates the Jew, again, not an unproblematic claim. However, both the anti-Semite and the Jew modify their behavior when under the gaze. In the case of the anti-Semite, Sartre asserts that he does not examine his personality within himself. Rather, he conforms to the expectations that others have of him to make remarks against Jews. The anti-Semite sees in the eyes of others a disquieting image, his own, and he makes his words and gestures conform to it. Having this external model, he is under no necessity to look for his personality within himself. Sartre suggests that there is a conformity to anti-Semitism here. He experienced a similar conformity, or you could say complicity with, during his 1945 visit to the United States, when Sartre was quickly assimilated as a white man, not a Frenchman, in an anti-black racist culture. Bernasconi explains that this assimilation to a racist culture was discovered by Sartre in the praxis of the gaze. Sartre was not only impacted by the objectifying gaze of the white Southerner toward the Negro, but also by the way in which the gaze of the Negro was averted from white faces. But before turning my attention to the phenomenology of racism in the US context, let me briefly turn to the anti-Semitic gaze. The circumstances under which the Jew encounters the gaze are much different from the gaze of conformity to anti-Semitism experienced by the anti-Semite. Sartre explains, as soon as he steps outside, as soon as he encounters others in the street or in public places, as soon as he feels upon himself the look of those whom a Jewish news newspaper calls them, a look that is a mixture of fear, disdain, reproach, and brotherly love, he must decide, does he or does he not consent to, the be, to be the person, to be the role they want him to play? And if he consents, to what extent? Under the gaze, everything the Jew does is subject, subject to examination and measured against the stereotype of the Jew. We find a framework similar to Sartre's gaze in the work of African-American scholars such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Richard Wright, or more, more recently, Bell Hooks, um, and even more recently, um, George Yancey. W.E.B. Du Bois, as early as 1903, describes the phenomenon of double consciousness for the American Negro in several of his works. Paul Gilroy's opening lines in the Black Atlantic state, striving to be both European and black, requires some specific forms of double consciousness. And this is an obvious reference to the work of Du Bois. In the souls of black folk in particular, we see this concept introduced in the first, first essay titled, Of Our Spiritual Strivings. Du Bois states, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on an amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. It is important to note that double damnation has both, or double consciousness, has both a negative and a positive connotation. More negatively, Du Bois describes how the Negro is subject to examination and measured by stereotypes, which give him a sense of seeing himself through the eyes of racist, contemptuous others. More positively, this double consciousness is a gift or second sight, signifying the ability to see things that the oppressor cannot. 
It is a kind of insight that is born out of the lived experience of the Negro or the member of the African diaspora who endures and confronts anti-black racism in its various forms, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, apartheid, colonialism, paternalism, the injustice system, the new racism without racists. Remarkably, Sartre writes about Wright's work in terms of doubleness and what is literature. Sartre argues each of Wright's works contains what Voltaire would have called a double simultaneous postulation. Each word refers to two contexts. Two forces are applied simultaneously to each phase and determine the incomparable tension of his tale. Sartre bases this claim on his observation that Wright has two audiences. As Sartre sees it, Wright is addressing himself to the cultivated Negroes of the North and the white Americans of goodwill. He adds, but Wright, a writer for a split public, has been able to maintain and go beyond the split. Over 30 years after the publication of Du Bois' as Souls, Richard Wright describes the phenomenon of the white gaze in the final chapter of his autobiographical work, Black Boy. Wright recalls how he intentionally approached his boss to discuss his plans to move to Chicago in a way that would not suggest that Wright was asserting his own will and thereby create hostility on the part of the whites with whom Wright worked. Having convinced the boss that he had to go to Chicago to help his mother, Wright states, there was a silence. White faces were looking strangely at me. I went upstairs feeling like a criminal. The word soon spread through the factory and white men looked at me with new eyes. And yet, Wright explains that he was able to, in a sense, resist the objectification of the Southern white gaze, if not indeed, at least in consciousness. He explains, my deepest instincts had always made me reject the place to which the white Southern South had assigned me. It had never occurred to me that I was in any way an inferior being. And no word that I ever heard fall from the lips of Southern white men had ever made me really doubt the worth of my own humanity. Wright goes on to describe his lived experience of the relationship between the, Southern, the Southerner and the Negro, a relationship that Sartre would take up two years later in black and white in the United States a portion of what is now revolutionary violence in notebooks for an ethics. Just as Sartre had made the albeit problematic assertion that the anti-Semite creates the Jew, he claims in revolutionary violence that the Southerner did not know the black man, he created him. An example of this claim is found in Wright's experience of the South. According to Wright, the white South said it knew niggers, and I was what the white South called a nigger. Well, well the white South has never known me. It never knew what I thought, what I felt. In other words, the white South did not know the Negro, but it did create the nigger. And you see similar claims made not only by Fanon in the context of colonialism, but also by people like James Baldwin in the US. Going outside of the United States, looking at the work of France Fanon on colonized Martinique, we find an explicitly Sartrean utilization of the gaze and black skin white masks. According to Fanon, in a similar way that Sartre claimed the anti-Semite creates the Jew, and the colonial world, the white man creates the Negro. He explains how the colonized Negro experiences the gaze and the absence of negritude. Fanon describes the gaze as the other, as a force of fixation. The movements, the attitudes, the glances of the other fixed me. He experiences his very being through the irresistible white gaze, insofar as the black man, he says, has no ontological resistance to the eyes of the white man. The black man becomes fixed by the gaze of the other and becomes objectified. And this is a direct consequence of contact with the colonizer. And he's pulling from Ame Césaire's account of contacts here too. When subjected to the gaze of whites, the black man is made to experience his being through the other and as inferior to the other. That is, until the Negro is presented with a new image of himself through negritude. While I will not go into the details again of this debate between Sartre and Fanon concerning negritude, it is important to note in another important shift in Sartre's account of the gaze that comes out of Black Orpheus. So Black Orpheus differs from anti-Semite and Jew in two main ways. First, he is speaking of whites and blacks rather than French whites and Jewish whites. And I say Jewish whites here because in Black Orpheus, uh, Sartre describes the Jew as a white man among white men. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, he is speaking of his own experience of the, gaze from, of, uh, of the gaze from blacks to whites, not vice versa. So Sartre states, here are black men standing, looking at us, looking at us white Europeans. 
and I hope that you, like me, will feel the shock of being seen. For 3,000 years, the white man has enjoyed the privilege of seeing without being seen. He was only a look. Today, these black men are looking at us, and our gaze comes back to our own eyes and their turn. Now, it must be said, stated that this preface is as much, if not more, about Sartre, France, and Europeans as it is about negritude as an expression of the black colonial experience. So there is a curious recentering of Frenchmen by Sartre here that is a bit paradoxical. Furthermore, while I think Sartre is taking up the issue of a certain power dyna dynamic operating in the gaze when he claims that the white man has enjoyed the privilege of seeing without being seen, clearly this is not actually the case. That is, white, man ha white men have been seen, though they may not have acknowledged it. Having said that, I think what Sartre is attempting to describe here is an oppositional gaze. I borrow this phrase from the title of a chapter in Black Looks, Race and Representation by Bell Hooks. In the op oppositional gaze, black female spectators, Hooks examines the gaze in several contexts, including adult-child interactions, master-slave interactions, and more contemporary examples from popular culture, including films and photographs. Hooks also emphasizes the pot potential hostility of the gaze, commencing her analysis with an example of the gaze between children and parents. Hooks recalls that as a child, she would be punished for staring and therefore made afraid to look, while simultaneously being expected to look at her parents when they were talking to her. According to Hooks, she was amazed the first time she read in history classes that white slave owners, men, women, and children punished enslaved black people for looking, and adds, the politics of slavery or racialized power relations were such that the slaves were denied their right to gaze. These punishments persisted even after the manumission of slaves and the continued criminalization of the gaze from black folks to white folks as a form of impudence and, and, and insolence. Thus, she fully appreciates the significance of the gaze as a form of agency, particularly, particularly for black people who throughout slavery and Jim Crow, and even more re recently, have been punished for looking. According to Hooks, all attempts to repress our black people's right to gaze has produced in us an overwhelming longing to look, a rebellious desire, an oppositional gaze. Even in the worst circumstances of domination, the ability to manipulate one's gaze in the face of structures of domination that would contain it opens up the possibility of resistance. I am proposing that it is this oppositional gaze that Sartre perceives in negritude. It is a gaze that also operated in the Harlem Renaissance and continues in contemporary hip hop and social media outlets. Sartre notes that through negritude, the status of the gaze has changed. And yet this move by Sartre is not merely a reversal of the gaze, although this may itself be a feat, because negritude is not just reversing the gaze from blacks to whites. It also encompasses a change in the gaze from blacks to other blacks. Sartre is suggesting that the gaze is a tool through which blacks see whites, and more importantly, see and know themselves differently. The significance of seeing and knowing oneself cannot be understated. Again, Richard Wright's Black Boy provides an illustration. He explains, not only had Southern whites not known me, but more important still, as I had lived in the South, I had not had the chance to learn who I was. But it is not just the American Negro or the colonized Negro who does not know himself. It is also the white Southerners and the white colonial oppressors who do not know themselves. For Sartre, the desired impact of the black gaze is that white people see themselves as oppressors and recognize the lie of their superiority. Again, Bernasconi explains in Sartrean terms, so long as Europeans and European Americans fail to pass through that totally disarming reversal of the gaze, their sense of their own superiority would remain untouched. He adds, consequently, we see in black Orpheus that the emphasis had moved from the direct gaze to a form of marginalization. Europeans would dis discover themselves by positively being ignored. They would cease to be the center of attention. Ironically, it, is, it seems that it is in the process of being ignored that the white man is confronted with his whiteness in a radically different way. He is confronted with the lie of white, whiteness and the falseness of white superiority. Sartre states in Black Orpheus, our whiteness seems to us to be a strange, lavid varnish that keeps our skin from breathing. White tights, worn out at the elbows and the knees, under which we would find real human flesh, the color of black wine, if we could remove them. 
Sartre's description of white tights here suggests that it is not just black people who wear white masks, as Fanon's title implied, but also white people who are masked. They are not only masked, they are completely covered in this varnish of white tights that, if, that they themselves cannot remove. Sartre even asserts that beneath these white tights is the real human flesh, which is actually black and can only be seen at the worn out knees and elbows. From this, one may get the impression that it is not, it is not the Negro, but the white man who needs this alienation. Only he does not realize it or is ill-equipped to achieve it. Thus, negritude and the reversal of the gaze present an opportunity for both the Negro and the white man to see and know themselves and one another differently. The gaze provides an opportunity for different and new racial contacts that confront rather than conform to existing racial hierarchies. To put it another way, Hooks explains, spaces of agency exist for black people, wherein, wherein we can both interrogate the gaze of the other, but also look back and at one another, naming what we see. The gaze has been and is a site of resistance for colonized black, black people globally. So now to the conclusion now. It's a real conclusion. It's not the preacher conclusion that goes on for 30 more minutes. Okay, so conclusion. The preachers in the audience appreciate that. Okay. Well, the Baptist preachers. I guess some preachers don't do that. Anyway, I digress. I digress. Okay, so it's, it's a paragraph and a half. So along these lines, it's been my intention to underscore the usefulness of the concept of the gaze and understanding race, interracial contra contacts, and racism. I am persuaded that existential phenomenology with its emphasis on existence or being, being in a concrete uh, situation and a recent study of appearance and embodiment provides theoretical resources for examining and articulating the situation and lived experience of those identified as black and even their white counterparts with given and or adopted identities. Furthermore, I take seriously the need for the white man to see himself as oppressor, as Sartre puts it, and to be disalienated, as Fanon puts it. I hope also to have demonstrated a richer understanding of Sartre's work is made possible when it is engaged with the work of other activist intellectuals like Fanon, Wright, as well as Du Bois and Hooks. Um, and so in closing, I will say that this paper really is a smaller portion of a paper um, in which I want to engage a more intersectional analysis of the gaze. So it offers, this particular paper offers a very male-centric representation of the gaze, and as I develop it, I really intend to go back to offer a feminist critique of this male-centric account of the gaze, while also taking seriously the particular ways in which women, especially women of color, experience the gaze. So I'm happy to discuss that in Q&A as well. And I think I've stayed within my time. Um, my moderator did not um, wave at me or anything, so I think I'm good. <laughs>